Hi, I'm Brooks Davis, and I'm here today to talk to you about address-based reservations. Address-based reservations are a new way to think about and manage the address space of a process, um, which both improves security and obeys the rules of systems programming languages a bit better by uh, obeying the rules of pointer providence. So what is pointer providence? Pointer providence is the idea that where a pointer comes from matters. This means that pointers allocated from different allocation calls, even if they end up through various manipulations having the same bit pattern, may be different. Um, a little more succinct definition of pointer providence here. Um, just because two pointers are the, point to the same address does not mean they are equal and can be used interchangeably. This is from uh, Ralph J. Um, he has a series of blog posts on the subject, and he's the one who pushed through the Rust RFC that says that Rust has providence. It uses a few more words than that, but at the end of the day, that's all it says. Um, it doesn't go into a lot of details. They tried to add as little as possible to the language and commit to as little as possible because there are areas around the edges where they're not sure what it means. Um, so yeah, so what has pointer providence? Well, C, as I said, um, and the elaboration here is sort of the latest write-up of how it might actually work. It is long. It is a bit esoteric, um, is very theory focused, but it is important because having a memory model for your programming language is essential for optimizations to be correct. It'd be cool if any language had a memory model, um, at least any systems language. Um, C++ um, basically from, from inherits provenance from C. I haven't found any indication that there's actually in the standard. I have found papers, however, um, in the standards committee that reference provenance. So it's acknowledged, it's there, you know, deal with it. Um, likewise, Rust has provenance. This was, this was uh, ratified earlier this year. Um, I follow the uh, OPSEM operational semantics group uh, in the Rust Zulip where a lot of this stuff takes place um, because it impinges on Cherry. Um, Cherry, not only do pointers have provenance, but if you, you, ha you must, in Cherry, you must derive a pointer from another pointer. You can shrink your pointer, you can reduce its permissions, um, and that's simply required at all times. Um, and that's, in Rust, there's a mode called strict provenance, which is not fully ratified yet, but like the features are there. It's like, I don't, I don't remember the Rust terminology, but call it alpha features. Um, the names are gonna change, that sort of thing, but, um, but they are there. So a bit more on on Cherry, so Cherry um, extends pointers. In this case here, we have 128-bit capabilities. Um, these extend 64-bit pointers, which are normally just addresses, um, with permissions and bounds, so met extra metadata. Um, these control how it can be used. You must manipulate a, a capability through guarded manipulation, which means, to, which means you must use special instructions. You can't just twiddle the bits. Um, you have to use special register to register operations um, to shrink the capability or, or um, increment it or whatnot. And then if you do anything wrong, there's a tag associated with it as well. So a 129th bit, um, which is separate from system memory uh, or separate from standard memory and not directly accessible. An incorrect derivation causes that tag to be cleared and therefore any attempt to use the capability to access memory fails. Um, in a Cherry system, all accesses to memory, both loads and stores, um, as well as you know, jumps or any control throw operation is via a capability. Either in a compatibility mode where that's implicit via a default data capability and program counter capability, um, which you can ignore completely in legacy code, um, or explicit, where, where you're using explicit capability operations for everything and you're using exactly the capability you need. So implementing release privilege and intentionality. Um, so a bit of the specific properties that Cherry enforces. Um, so we, in, we enforce integrity and provenance validity. This means that you can't just make a capability up out of nowhere and try to access something. There's no way to do that. Um, Further, bounds pre prevent access from one thing to going from one object leading to access to another, so long as object is appropriately defined. So if they're, if they're separ properly separated, then there's no way to leap between them. 
Monotonicity means that you can't take a pointer to a small subset of something and turn it into one, one to, the lar to a larger thing, except, of course, by having access to the larger thing and looking it up um, through some other mechanism. And then permissions allow you to do things, permit un unintended use. So, for example, to prevent you from using a writable pointer as an executable pointer. Um, and so you could implement WXRX at, the point, at pointer granularity, even if the underlying page permissions allow both. So these, these primitives, we use them to implement strong spatial and temporal safety in the C, C programming language and C++. Um, and we also build on top of those primitives the ability to do um, extremely scalable compartmentalization. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but you know, as, a, as sort of a hint, we can do millions of domain transitions per second, um, which if you were doing that in process with a process-based compartmentalization is completely unimaginable. Um, so that's, that's where we're, that's sort of the, the, the fastest possible introduction to Cherry, because um, we've got other things to talk about. So Cherry ABI is a process ABI. It's a new process abstraction, um, like 32-bit versus 64-bit processes, um, that where all pointers are Cherry capabilities. It's implemented on, on Cherry BSD, and it's our default ABI. Um, Cherry BSD is our free BSD fork that we've maintain, been maintaining for quite some time. Um, the kernel in Cherry ABI provides bounded pointers for all mappings. So you're at, you have this address space for your program, but you can't access any of it until the kernel grants you access to, this, to specific bits. Um, so that means things like your, your initial executable, um, your stack, um, things that you've mmapped. Uh, well, I'll show you a picture of it in a little bit, but uh, to make it a little more concrete. But uh, you, you get capabilities to things you have access to, and the rest of that address space might as well not exist. Um, until the kernel grants it. Now, system call, one key feature of Cherry ABI is that system calls do not violate capability boundaries. Um, this is, so there's no kernel escape hatch, um, at least no deliberate kernel escape hatch. Bugs obviously are bugs, but um, for the most part, actually, the way we use copy in and copy out to access uh, user space means that um, there is no escape hatch and even, and bugs aren't really something you can have. You could have a bug, but it's gonna just mean you fault. Um, so this is necessary to implement least privilege and make it all work, it is also necessary for compartmentalization where you might have two completely disjoint things running in your address space and you don't want them to be able to interfere with each other. Um, even though historically, you might think of them, that them as owning that address space. So MMAP additionally, um, can only manipulate the backing of either a new mapping, so address space that no one was using, or via an existing capability. Um, this is to decouple address space reservation and backing store configuration. And we actually make an additional thing, we have a software permission on the capability so that, for instance, malloc is, can, can give up that permission in the capabilities it returns, which means that uh, callers of malloc can't, you know, say, unmap all that, can't unmap that memory um, or turn it executable. So now a digression. Um, part of the reason I gave this talk is because I love this visualization and I always thought this would be a great way to show memory layouts. Because the problem with showing how memory works is it's this big ass line, you know, 64 bits. How do you even think about that, right? Um, so thankfully, we have this cool representation uh, called a Hilbert curve, um, which turns, it's a fractal, which turns a linear thing into a, you know, into a nice two-dimensional thing. Um, and it's compact and, and it's cool. So random XKCD for your benefit. It's also a neat map. It's, somebody should redo it because it's actually quite old. Um, and a lot of this address space has been sold off, so it's probably like half AWS or something, but no. <laughs> Um, so now let's, let's sort of take, take an example here and lay out a simple process address space. This is a static program, it's not to scale, and there's no address space layout randomization because nothing makes any sense once you, once you turn on address space layout randomization. Thankfully with Cherry we don't need it, so we turn it off, it's great. Um, so first thing in your address space, 
the very bottom, that first page where Null lives, no mappings are allowed. Um, POSIX even says so. Um, turns out there were some mistakes made. Um, there was a bug in SE Linux, um, which resulted in a null pointer execution. Um, and because no one thought about it, most ABIs, including Linux and FreeBSD at the time, um, allowed you to map something at the null address. Um, and the result of that was that uh, you could, you know, make the kernel run whatever you wanted uh, from user space. Oops. Um, so that was that was cute. Um, so we don't. So no mappings there, um, unless you turn on a special flag and run an eight out binary. Blah blah blah. Um, so well now let's map in a program. The first bit of a program is the text segment. That's the instructions. Um, that's followed by the data segment, and then that's followed by BSS, which is all the global variables and static variables, which default to zero. Um, so anything uninitialized ends up there, and. Uh, and so that's, that's your program. Um, at the end of that is what is known as the break. Um, in the bad old days, um, the way we allocated system memory was uh, that we would just extend the bit, of, well, bit beyond the program and we would say, okay, kernel, page this in and out. Um, and, and we'd use the, the, the break or S break uh, instruction, uh, uh, system call to adjust this. It used to be the break system call, and then we got C, and then that became awkward, um, since that's a keyword. Um, so it became S break or BRK. But anyway, there's that, and then that can extend, oops, that can extend up to the end of the sort of classic heap. We won't talk about this anymore. It's a bad idea. I removed it from Cherry ABI. But nonetheless, it's there. It does affect one thing that we'll get to in just a moment. But let's jump to the end of the address space. At the very end of the address space, there's a shared object, um, if it's not randomized, uh, which you know holds the bits of things to do: fast, get time of day, get PID, uh, that sort of thing. There's a bunch of your, I think maybe your uh, signal trampoline, um, some other stuff. So there's, there's a bunch of stuff there, and then there's your stack. Um, so you have a big stack allocation. It is however big it's allowed to be. Um, in fact, most of it is mapped to what we call map guard. So it's a special mapping type in the kernel which you can't access, um, although you, with stacks you can grow into it, but uh, you can't accidentally map over it is the main thing. Um, and then we have an actual guard page in the more common sense, which is we have a page with no permissions, the end of the stack. So if you hit the top and you actually just ease into it instead of popping over the guard at least, um, you'll, you'll hit a page and you'll crash, as you should, um, before you stomp on something else. And then things from MMAP start, start getting allocated at the end of this so-called heap. Um, and so MMAP puts stuff there, so malloc. I didn't put more examples because I got bored. But uh, you know, this is where all your allocations go. If you load a, if you DL open something, it's there, or if you, you know, if you MMAP a file, they just sort of end up along there. So that's sort of the basics, basic orientation to address space. Now, um, let's talk about the MMAP system call. Quick reminder of how it, how it looks, um, or if it's not a reminder, then how it works. It returns a pointer. Um, it takes an address argument. Um, in the kernel, this is often known as a hint, because sometimes it, it, with MMAP, you're saying, I want to map something right at adder. But other times it's zero, which means I don't care where you put it. And then other, yet other times it's, please try to put it here, but you know, if you can't, then put it somewhere else. Um, and those are the things that POSIX allowed, there, allows. There are some other things that are possible, but um, in pretty much every implementation, but those are the things POSIX lets you, say, lets you do. Um, then there's the length, that's how many page, basically it's, you know, it's, it's size and bytes, how many, how many pages do you want to allocate? Um, it's supposed to be page align, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then there's prot, this is page protections for the, for the mapping. Uh, next, we have flags. Flags are how to do the mapping. That's, do you want to put it, do you definitely want it at address, at the address? Um, is it an anonymous mapping? Is it a shared mapping? Um, is it a file, uh, et cetera? There's a file descriptor in case you're mapping a file. There's an offset in the file. I don't care about those last two, so we're not gonna talk about them. 
because um, that's the because what I'm interested in is the interactions of how we're laying things out in address space and mapping them. So MMAP does lots of things. So it alloc you know simple things like allocate some space for malloc. You know you might map files with it. Um, maybe a shared file mapping. Maybe not. Um, you might map a shared library, which might look something like this. The process in FreeBSD is we do a guard mapping. Um, so we reserve the address space. And then we map text segment, data segment, BSS in. It's just like a program. They're all the same, except whether they have a start address. Um, and so that's all, that's all very simple and straightforward. These are common things. This is how most MMAP use works. And then maybe it does some other things too. So we can ex we, we sometimes extend allocations. So one one thing J malloc does is it says, oh, I'd like to ex I'd like some more memory, and I would like to not have more more chunks of data to, or more more sort of pools to manage. So let's try to map just after the end of the current one and see what happens. Um, if the new thing that comes back um, is where I hoped then we just treat it all as one mapping. Um, this is fine, um, at least in the, in the existing system. Um, but we'll get to why it's a problem later. Um, but it also, MMAP like, just doesn't care about what you're doing. Like the interface, you can do ridiculous things. So you could shingle this map, make a shingled mapping. Why you would do that, I don't know, it'd be nuts, but you could do it. Um, you know, just completely absurd. Uh, things are possible, or random fixed mappings. Whoops, um, <laughs> that's fine. Nothing prevents that. Um, as long as it's fixed, it'll even stomp right over guard pages. Um, well, actually, it can't do what I just drew. I realized, but anyway, uh, it uh, you you well, you could do that in a series of mappings anyway. But um, last minute slide change. So anyway, that's you know, so it can do all sorts of things. Some of them good, some of them kind of weird, some of them bad. Um, so problems with MMAP. One problem is that it conflates two things. It does address space allocation and it configures backing store and permissions. Um, and these, you know, it works fine, but these are two different things. So it'd be nice if it didn't, if it was a little more it was, if it was clear what you were doing at any given moment, and sometimes it gets a little confused. Um, all MMAP calls, scholars can do anything. Um, there's some things like map guard, uh, map, uh, the, the map guard type, and then there's also things like the map exclusive flag, which prevent you from accidentally stomping on things. But they are, they are guardrails. They're not, nothing prevents you from just making a call with, that ignores them. Um, and every call is with ambient authority. So you, you always have control over your whole address space in the traditional system. And then there's also a lack of agreement beyond the simple things in POSIX. So we spell everything differently in every operating system, yay. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, as I see it, the big problems with MMAP. So let's talk about updating MMAP for Cherry ABI. So, we don't change normal, M, what, what I call normal MMAP use, my first example. So like you can allocate things, um, you could take a guard, and then you have this pointer now to the, to the guard so you can start filling in the contents. Um, and that all works fine. But what about weird stuff in the Cherry changes um, that we get to? So because in Cherry, as I mentioned way earlier, you have to make a mapping, you, have, you can only operate on address space either that is unoccupied or via a capability to that address space. Um, we get some slightly weird things. So if you take the capability you got to the first allocation and you try to allocate some new stuff based on just adding length to it, we actually don't let you do that. Um, and the reason we don't let, let you do that, I'll get into in more detail, but um, you're using the authority to manipulate the malloc, this malloc region, to try to do something outside it, and we don't allow that. So there's some there's some more nuance to that I'll get to in a little bit, but that's the, the one of the things we we don't allow. Um, turns out this is pretty straightforward to handle. The only case I know of that really does this is JA malloc, um, and and due to its design, 
all you have to do is say, uh, well, that map failed, because it already handles that case. So we just make it always fail and everything's fine. Um, and for absurd things, you can't do this abs absurd shingled mapping thing. You know, you can't create this thing that spans part of the allocation and part not. Um, this one, you actually could maybe make this one um, if you made the right cast, um, and I'll talk a little more about that in detail, but in a sense, you know, you can't do all those things. And you also can't do absurd random mappings. Um, or rather, you can make those, because we, for compatibility with old code, um, we allow fixed mappings so long as no one's there. So you do that up to this point, and then no, you can't do that. Um, that's, that's outside the rules. So we break a few things. Um, one of the things that I glossed over when I introduced capabilities at the beginning um, is that you might, you might have noticed that we had 128 bits of, bits of uh, data and we have 64 bits of pointer, and then we have a bottom and a top to that allocation. So where did we, how, how did we get, um, how did we squeeze that in? We got 196 bits of information um, that we need to, or 192 bits of information that we need to squeeze in there. So obviously we had to do some bounds compression. Um, so bounds are compressed floating point, um, they're, 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 they're a floating point style compression. Um, bounds are relative to the address. This means that you have to stay within a certain region. If you go too far outside, you'd be referring to some other region. So we have some rules there. But also that um, bound, as the allocation gets larger, the granularity gets coarser. So, uh, so that means that, so we only have a certain number of bits available to represent our bounds. Um, and of course, different alignments and lengths require different numbers of bits to represent. So I'll show you some examples of different ways to represent 14 pages. So this is, I think, the worst possible 14 pages um, you could come up with in terms of alignment and, and whatnot. Um, so that would take some number of bits to represent. Um, here's a more aligned version where we've sort of peeled one bit off the back and stuck it on the front. And that would be more aligned, that would take probably a a bit or something less to represent, or half a bit. Um, you can be more compact, or you could be very, you could be compact and aligned. Um, so this is, this is an issue. You might also, with Cherry, one of the things, because of this, you know, because of this granularity, allocations sometimes need to be padded. Um, and the thing with padding allocation, so, so you, you sometimes need to pad them out, because otherwise you'd have aliasing. If you didn't have this pad, say, um, you might do another allocation, now this memory is available, this address space is available, and then you have two overlapping things, and that's, that's bad. Um, you wanna prevent that or else, why have monotonicity properties if you just go ahead and create aliases? Um, so I will note, like, this example is completely contrived um, so that you can actually see it, um, but it sort of illustrates the, one of the challenges we have with Cherry, which is that things have to be rounded and they have to be aligned in order to fit within the representation. Now Cherry has lots more bits than, than this takes. Um, we have on our Risk Five, Cherry Risk 564 port we're, and the old MIPS one, we are I think have about 12 bits of representability. Um, and on uh, Morello there's 16 because uh, one potential customer has 16K pages. Uh, so they, they need, and we wanna be able to have byte granularity represent the representability within a standard page size, um, just for sort of maximum compatibility. Um, so, let's talk briefly about unmapping memory. Just like mmap, mmunmap can unmap anything. You can, you can in fact write code that says unmap from the beginning of my address space to the end of the address space, and it'll happen. <laughs> uh, be very exciting at that point, but um, you know you could do that. There's nothing, nothing stopping you. So what's uh, even and even with Cherry ABI and our restrictions there, you can still punch holes in mappings. So you have a let's say we have this mapping, and for some reason maybe we're maybe we think we're creating naively think we're creating guard pages by just making unmapped sections. That's a thing people do. It's not a good idea, but it's a thing people do. I'll show you why it's not a good idea. So we punched a couple of holes here. 
Um, and now something comes along and allocates a page. Well, there's the first spot. Two pages, there's the second spot. Um, and now those the pointers return from those allocations and our big allocation, they alias. Um, so that's not good. Now we, now, we have, we might, now we have two active things that think they can write to the same place potentially. You know, maybe, hopefully the code's like not doing that because the guards were just to protect you, but you know, it's a problem. Um, so reservations to the rescue. Reservations are the thing I created to make this all work. So to make, make the padding work, to make, the to make all the alignment padding work, and to make unmapping be sensible and not have these races. Um, so an initial mapping, anytime you do an M map and it allocates address space, that creates, and of course necessarily because of the conflation of the two things, populates, um, populates a, something I call a reservation. Um, reservations cannot be merged. We, don't, we do not allow them to be merged, even if they're the same type. Um, so we do create some additional memory fragmentation, or rather some additional memory map fragmentation, but we have not been able to measure a performance impact from that. Um, when you unmap something as part of a, part of a region, it, trans it, it enters an unmapped state. So an entry remains in the VM map um, that cannot be mapped over. It's much like the map guard uh, that I talked about earlier, except for that bit where it can't be mapped over. Then, so yeah, and then if you have padding, it starts unmapped as well. So it means it can never be mapped over. Uh, and the reason for that is that you need to be able to unmap everything in a, in a uh, so, and then it, need to be, it needs to be unmapped so that when you unmap everything you think you allocated, um, you, uh, you have unmapped, then everything in that reservation becomes unmapped. At that point, it's safe to free the reservation. Um, at least mostly safe, I'll get to it in a moment. Um, so so that was, that, that's sort of the, the big challenge was to prevent uh, prevent that aliasing to ensure the padding worked. And one of the, the reason I was driven to this model where you have, um, you have this pad that's unmapped, because MMAP, somewhat surprisingly in a sense, doesn't have a way to tell you how much space it mapped. Um, so you can't do things like, you know, I would like a super page, I'd like a super page allocation for anything that's close to a super page. Um, in the current model, like you have to actually explicitly request something that's super page size. You can't request something a little short and be given one anyway because, you know, why not? Um, you know, address space is cheap. Uh, instead, you're you're forced to to uh, um, you know you're, you're you you have to ask for what you want. Which you know, sure, it makes sense. It's like an, it's an explicit interface. You're supposed to be you're supposed to know what you're doing, uh, et cetera. But in a sense, it's a little surprising that there's no way to say, eh, actually, we're gonna give you a bit more. Um, or to be able to map a file descriptor or something and just be, give it, just be told how much that is there. You know, it'd be neat if you could just say, you know, length minus one and when you map a file and just get the file. Maybe, I don't know. Anyway, the, uh, the fact is though that there's no, way to, there's no way for MMAP to tell you how much was allocated. With Cherry, you can observe it in the capability um, by, by looking at the length but that would be a compatibility issue. That, if you had to actually write extra code to say, oh, how much was mapped for me, so that you could actually uh, unmap it, that would never work out. People wouldn't do it, because too many code changes. Um, so I said, you know, there's, you know, so once the, everything's in a reservation's unmapped, you can free it, but let's consider a sequence of events. Um, we, we mmap a file for some reason to read it. We do some stuff, we unmap the file. And maybe we're not careful with the pointer. Um, maybe there's a bug in our code, so the pointer still pointer that file still around. Now, we do some mallocs. Malloc says, oh, I need some more memory. Um, need some more address space. So uh, mmap then picks up from the top of the heap and it finds the spot where that file used to be. 
Um, and now we have aliasing uh, between the file, the pointer from the file and the pointer from MMAP. So we might have two things contending, bad, you know, use, so reuse after MMAP, basically use after free. Um, and so that's a problem. So the usual answer is, of course, as in systems programming is don't do that. Um, we know how effective don't do that is by the fact that memory safety bug, the graph of memory safety bugs fixed in major software is a flat line. Um, has a proportion of, uh, proportion of bugs over time. So we know, we know how well that works. So the cherry answer is we have capability revocation. Um, we have the ability to hold something in quarantine and eventually be sure that there are no references to it before we reuse it. So how does it work? So first, you know, as I say, a reservation is unmapped over time. So we punch some holes at it. Eventually, the whole thing's unmapped. There's one, one unmapped entry. At that point, um, without revocation, we would just free it, and that would be like the, like a normal, you know, the, like the normal system, basically. The address space would be available. Instead, we stick it in quarantine. Um, when, it's, when it's in quarantine, um, now, now we can't map over it, um, even if we have a capability to it, and we can't, um, we can't access it. So it's just, it's held there, it's a, a waiting revocation. Now, let's consider one next to it. Um, and now the other one next to it gets unmapped, it enters quarantine. Now because there's no, no one could ever access these, unlike with regular reservations, we do allow them to be merged. Um, so we can, that that's, takes a little pressure off the VM system um, while we wait for processing because uh, revocation is a little bit expensive. So eventually a revocation pass comes along, it sees the largest thing that's in quarantine, um, and it says, okay, I'm gonna add that to my list for while, while I do a sweep. Now, a sweep, I'm not gonna go into any of the optimizations and details, but um, the, uh, the general strategy is that we stop all the threads in the program, we analyze their register set, if they have any capabilities that have been revoked, um, so such as this quarantine capability or any, or any subset of it um, in their register sets, we invalidate those. We also scan the kernel for things like KQ, AIO, other things that hoard pointers to user space. Um, and we, we hunt those down and we, we, we invalidate them. And then we perform a scan of all of user space. Now we have, some, we have some, a bunch of clever tricks, um, which I, if I have time maybe I'll talk about or you can ask about in Q&A. But uh, in any way, we scan all of memory and because we have tags, we can tell what is a pointer and what is not a pointer. And the other cool, cool thing is that because the base, because of the monotonicity properties, if the base address is within the range of something that's been, that's been uh, uh, deallocated and therefore in quarantine, we can check that. If the base address is, well, if the base address is, is within any allocation, then it must be from that allocation. It doesn't matter what address you've given it, if it's inbounds, out of bounds, we just ignore all that. We don't worry about the top either, because the top also is annoying. Um, but uh, the base is always within bounds um, of the original allocation, unless it's a zero length ca capability. But um, it was a zero length capability to the end. But in any case, we can always identify all pointers that are within alloc existing allocations that have been quarantined. We can invalidate them. And then we're, when we're done invalidating them, we remove the quarantine entry and now the address space is available again. This is primarily, the, the actual work is primarily coupled with the, with the user space allocators, um, but is beyond the scope of this talk. We just side, I, I sort of tacked it onto the side to remove the largest quarantine entry on each pass. Um, there's a cleverer trick that would let us remove them all, um, but the bit math hurt my head, so I didn't do it. Um, and I wanted to get the sweeping working first. Uh, also, like this addresses the problem. Uh, I don't know of any. I don't know of any case where we're creating such fragmented memory maps that it matters that we're 
you know, we can only do one at a time. Generally speaking, we can actually expand out to the to the neighbor neighboring quarantine or the not immediate neighbors, but where no one's in, in between during the revocation pass as well. So we can be pretty efficient there. So one odd side effect of revocation is of course that it's batched because we are scanning all of process memory. This is not fast. Um, you know, the overall overheads are pretty reasonable, um, but it's not, it's decidedly not free. Um, so we don't do it every ad, every free, um, that would suck. Um, you know, we'd like free to be tens of instructions. Um, so the unmapped address space isn't Im immediately available. That means stale capabilities become invalid at some arbitrary point after unmap. Um, because eventually we get around to doing a sweep and we, and we kill them, you know, we, we, we clear their tag bit um, is in the current implementation. So we want mmap with capabilities that have previously been freed to behave consistently. One of the problems we, you'd run into conceptually um, is that we would like it to be, we would, it, would like there to be no difference in behavior between trying to map it something that's been, where the whole reservation's been unmapped, whether or not the tag has been cleared, because it would be weird um, if it changed. So first thing we do is, we, is that if the address argument is a valid capability, then we require that it must be to an active reservation um, and that the map fixed flag must be set. So the only thing you can do with that capability is allocate, is change the backing store. Um, you're not allowed to, um, you're not, for instance, allowed to try to map off the end. Um, you're not allowed to reuse it, um, whether it's, whether the reserva and if the reservation has been removed, you're not allowed to map over it again. Because occasionally spot code out there that does mmap, do some stuff, unmap, remap. Well, next slide I'll show you where there's a race. So the other, the other rule is that, po the other positive rule is that if the address is null derived, which is to say we've casted a plain integer to a pointer, then it must not, then, the, then, it, then if we're doing map fixed, it must not correspond to an existing reservation. Um, we can't, you can't arbitrarily just forge something and stomp on an existing reservation. That violates least privilege. Um, by implication, the address argument mu must not have metadata and be invalid. Because the only way, the only sensible way you could get there is that you have unmapped it and then the revocation pass has occurred. And we don't want there to be a difference in behavior based on when the revocation pass has occurred because you may, your thread may have no idea that it's happened. Um, and it would be super weird to debug if, you know, very occasionally when, you're, when this thread got really slow, things worked and other times, um, and other times it didn't. So we're, I, I, am, I am focusing here on trying to make the interface consistent versus being overly friendly. My view is that MAP use is relatively rare and the people who use it know what they're doing. That's probably slightly too strong an assumption, but um, most, for the most part, people have a mental model of how it should work and they, they, and they know what they're doing. They might have to learn a slightly new mental model to handle us, but um, generally speaking, the number of call sites is small. It's straightforward and audible um, with some effort. So, once there, it, when we turned to a little unmapping bug in the wild, like it didn't hurt anything, but it's an exemplar of a bug. So AutoComp, prior to the latest release, um, had this code snippet. It had error handling and stuff, but we'll ignore all that. Um, so it mmaps a page, you know, somewhere. Then unmaps the page, and then tries to map over it. Um, the comment you'll note though says, we're map, try, try to mmap the file at a fixed address which already has something else allocated in it. Oops, that's not true. Um, turns out that this, this unmap was introduced about 10 years ago um, when SIGWIN support was added for the mmap probe. Um, 
Now, this code never runs um, for most people because on Linux, it's defined to always succeed. Um, so it runs everywhere else and probably pointlessly. Um, um, at least on BSDs, it's sure the test is pointless. Um, but it started failing. One of our users porting software to Cherry noticed this and said, well, why don't you have MMAP? It's like, we have MMAP. What are you talking about? Um, so we dug in, here, found this code. So here's the thing, though. In a, in a, in a real program, which is multi-threaded, um, you might think it's not, but there's a good chance it is, even if you don't think it is, because you might have, your system administrator might have configured it, your system to use LDAP for names. And if you've done, you know, you know, get PWNT or something in your program, your program is multi-threaded now, um, because you've loaded open LDAP. So anyway, your, your program is multi-threaded. So here, you know, as, as I showed in that example earlier, if you do the unmap, well now somebody could map here. Um, before you get to the M map, and now you have exciting things happen because in standard ALEC, this map fixed is going to succeed. Um, regardless of whether someone was, had, was mapped there, even if it was something, somebody else is mapping. Um, and as a result, there's a race here. So the simple solution is of course simple, and of course fixing the test was simple. Um, we just delete the unmap, so don't do that. If you want to manipulate the same address, you know, if you want to manipulate something that's previously mapped, then you have to use the capability to it and you have to not unmap it. Um, so it's a trivial change, um, but it's an exemplar of the sort of coding bug you see very occasionally. Most people understand that there's a race here, but sometimes you see code that doesn't. So one other change that we had to make um, to MMAP that's not related to the reservation stuff um, is that, re recall that MMAP returns pointers, which means capabilities in Cherry ABI. The property of monotonicity means that the capability returned when the reservation is cr created must have all the permissions required, that are ever required for that region of memory. So in a library, even if you have WX or X, with the current interface, you must return an RWX capability because parts of it are text and parts of it are data. There's no, there's no current way around that. You know, and, and it's a common pattern, even if you don't have FreeBSD's map guard to do it, to just make a reservation with, to, to reserve some address space with plot none. I mean, this is how most people think about it when they're, when they're piecing in a library. Is I reserve some address space and I put some stuff in it, um, which is why I think reservations work. Um, so what do we do? Well. We convert to, um, we, we add this new uh, flag that we added, that I actually imported into FreeBSD because it's a kind of minor weak mitigation as well. Um, you can specify the maximum protections, maximum page protections of a mapping with this prop max uh, set of flags. It, basically it's just the prop flags shifted up. Um, and so that we can specify both the current mapping, the current, uh, the current permissions we want, current page protections, and the maximum we'd like to allow. Um, FreeBSD already had a mechanism internally that did this, so when you map certain types of files, um, you would not be able to allow, allowed to upgrade the mapping to something that the file, the underlying file couldn't support. Um, so now we, we just made it, we had exposed it and made it explicit. So the capability, and this, so the capability now, um, let's, I say it gets read-write permissions, but what I mean is the capability gets whatever you specified in maxprot, um, and then you can change the page access later, um, and then and up, up to uh, that, that value specified by maxprot. And this gave us a way to get a capability that's the, that's the one we wanted, so as, only as many permissions as we want, but still do this prot and untrick. Um, so that, for instance, guard pages within the mapping would just be ones we didn't touch, um, which is a, is a current pattern. So uh, Arm, Arm Morello took a different approach. They, didn't have a, they don't have a max prot concept in Linux. Um, so in their Linux port, they just return RWX capabilities and you need to reduce them um, yourself because they didn't, they didn't feel confident in their ability to get to, 
uh, the Linux community do, or the probably GLibC, to adopt PropMax. So, a summary of the changes I've made to MMAP for Cherry. So, an initial allocation uh, reserves a fixed amount of address space. It's fixed for the life of the reservation. There's no growth um, without basically creating new mapping. There is no immediate reuse, there, there's no ability to immediately reuse, reuse unmapped address space. Um, generally speaking, there is no need for this. Um, it's kind of a, an unnecessary thing to do, just trust the kernel to allocate things. The allocator's a bit linear, but otherwise fine. Um, in general, that, you know, as, as I pointed out, that, that sort of reuse is unsafe in general, so you shouldn't be doing it because some other thread might come in and muck with you and that would be bad. Um, if, you do have a, if you do find that you have like a test program where you want some address space that you know is unmapped, and that's one reason this sort of thing was done historically, um, the solution I use in FreeBSD is I use libprocstat to walk the address space mappings and just find something that's empty in the right size. Um, and I've got code for that. It's BSD license, it's in Terry BSD. Um, straightforward. Um, not entirely portable, obviously, but there's gonna be something like this, you know, some proc or something or sysfs or something uh, uh, file you can read on Linux. And then use um, PropMax to control capability permissions. You wanna learn more about PropMax, there's an article I wrote in the journal a while back. So, now, are, all these, are these incompatibilities that I've talked about, and then little things that we don't work anymore, worth it? I mean, I do, I do break an abstraction that our system allocator uses, right? Um, but it's not, I think, very important in practice. So, you know, let's start with the negative. Start with Hiram's law. Hiram's law says that with a sufficient number of users of an API, it does not matter what you promise in the contract. All observable behaviors of your system will be depended on by somebody. Or, more amusingly, the XKCD um, changes in, ver in, ver in version blah. The, uh, the CPU no longer overheats when you hold down the space bar. Comments. This, this update broke my workflow. My control key is hard to reach, so I hold the space bar instead. And I, re I configured Emacs to interpret a rapid temperature rise as control. Admin writes back, that's horrifying. User writes, look, my setup works for me. Just add an option to re-enable spacebar heating. So this is one of my favorite XQCDs, especially because I like deleting things. And then people get whiny. Um, so, um, you know, on the, are some, some more, some arguments in favor. Um, you know, I will, I will say there is, there is another more serious argument against, which is uh, reservations do, um, do somewhat increase fragmentation in the VM map. Um, I think there, there are people who, who, sh who I believe know what they're talking about, who are concerned about like the number of total mappings. But we have not observed any you know, obvious impact uh, in, for instance, spec benchmarks. It's just not, it's not showing up. So some arguments in favor. Well, if you follow the reservation model, then you, then you, inf then you respect pointer provenance. You don't, go willy-nilly mangling the address space. And all your system's programming languages expect this is true. Even if they haven't written it down, they expect that, you know, you are accessing things via a pointer you got from somewhere, not from some other random pointer. Um, and they make assumptions and optimizations on that. Um, we eliminate some races, that's nice. Um, you know, if you follow the rules, then certain bugs go away. Um, and the changes are portable, in as much as anything with MMAP is portable. Um, if you write as though you have reservations, then you will get that, that then your code will still work on any existing system. Um, there's no, we're not, we're not chain, we are, we are slightly restricting what you can do, but we are not fundamentally altering what you can do in a major way. Um, and then, you know, somewhere between five and 10 million lines of code have our, with C++ or memory safe with Cherry um, today. You know, I would like that range to be tighter, but it turns out counting is really hard. Um, but uh, you know, so over here on, on the right, we have um, 
a memory, a screenshot of a, a KDE desktop. Everything on here except the Chromium web browser is, has spatial and temporal memory safety and in fact has fine-grained library compartmentalization. Um, so every library lives in its own sandbox um, and we perform domain transitions between them for every, um, our trampolines between them, they have their own stacks. Um, the, uh, it would be, we believe, quite hard to escape um, from, from those individual sandboxes. In, in fact, like Ocular up here, probably with this PDF, I don't remember how, if this is a super complicated PDF or only a somewhat complicated PDF, but it probably has 190 compartments in it and perform several million trans, uh, compartment transitions per second um, in normal idle operation. Um, it is mind-boggling that it all works. But that's the thing you get by enabling this, this work and getting cherry memory safety is you also get um, extraordinary compartmentalization. Um, so that's sort of, that's my arguments in favor. I think like it's also just easier to think about if you're thinking about, okay, I've allocated some address space, I'm gonna make some changes to it, not, I'm gonna try to glue a bunch of stuff together and figure out how it works and paint all over this address space. I just think it's a lot simpler to think in terms of providence, and in fact, programmers mostly do already. Um, it's one of our observations is people don't, only really weird systems programmers um, violate providence, even most of the time, not too much. So, a few impl implementation notes. Um, so reservations are enabled on a per VM map basis. So they're, they're, they're uh, in, in Cherry BSD, they're on for Cherry ABI processes and off for everybody else. Um, each reservation is identified by the lowest virtual address of the reservation. And that's an entry that's added to the struct VM map entry. Um, as I mentioned before, entries from different reservations can't be merged. So we just changed the code that checks if you can merge. Um, so that you can't merge if the reservations are different unless they're both quarantines in which that's a different rule. Um, unmapped entries um, have a map, map entry guard flag set or a map, map entry unmapped flag. It's basically the same as the, guard, the map guard um, except that you can't map over them and there's a few other edge cases. But mostly I implemented that by searching for guard and adding a or. Um, so the one, one difference is that Morello, at least as specified, Morello Linux um, does allow mremap to extend to the end of the allocation, which seems okay-ish, um, at least as long as the starting address is still mapped, that's probably all right. Um, quarantine state is not implemented as a map entry flag. Um, Instead, because we quarantine requires different VM inherit, different inheritance behavior when you fork, um, specifically because a particular entry might be being revoked right now and therefore on a list, except so you now have to make a copy of it and, re and make sure that's the one on the, on the set, on the, or in the uh, entry that's being revoked. Um, we have different behavior, so it turns out that it makes more sense to identify it via an, the inheritance value rather than by another flag. Um, and I say, you know, we, oops, not failed. Um, and and as, I, as I mentioned before, quarantines can be merged. So, so if, you, if you have a program that like maps a gazillion files and then unmaps them all, um, they can just be merged together as long as they're adjacent. So some open questions, how should M map mremap interact with reservations. Um, we don't have mremap, so I haven't like sat down and worked hard and thought about it, um, but it's a question. I think it's even theoretically possible that you could support mremap extending beyond the reservation so long as nothing was there, but that's pretty fraught. Um, one of the main problem being it's hard to tell, well, you, you would have to use compiler intrinsics to determine whether or not you have a different capability. Um, or else you would always have to update every copy at that pointer. This is a problem that uh, MMAP also has, and it has the same potential for undefined behavior. So, and then 
do address based recommendation or reservations make sense for non cherry ABIs. You'd have to have an opt out because you'd have to support old code that doesn't work that way. Does it, does it increase VM map entry count enough to, to matter? I don't know. Um, we don't think so, but we haven't really tested much. Um, would it be a helpful transition aid to make it optional? I don't know. Um, and then, you know, when should we merge Cherry into FreeBSD? So we got it in the main line. Um, so I will say that I think we're, we're getting close to the point where silicon we can run Cherry on that is commercial and not a prototype is, it's approaching inevitable at this point. Uh, I think we're not there yet. We probably won't try to land it for 15, but 16 seems actually pretty plausible. Um, Cherry RISC-V standardization is moving along. It's a little glacial, but it is, it is coming along. Um, and we're hoping to have some silicon that we can run, uh, Cherry RISC-V silicon we can run on next year. So, questions? David. Uh, the desktop that I that I showed is uh, Arms Morello prototype. Um, that's a four-core um, um, Newiverse N1 based uh, design prototype design. Um, they're available for ordering for testing and development, um, but they're you know we have there's a thousand total boards manufactured. Um, yes. Um, so. Is there support in Beehive to run this virtually? Um, well, there's two answers to that question. One is you can't run it on, on a system that doesn't have Cherry um, because you have to emulate it. We do have QEMU support that is fully emulated because you have to em emulate the Cherry hardware. Um, if you have Cherry hardware, if you have Morello hardware, we do have Beehive support. And in fact, we have basically first light on uh, RISC-V RISC -V Beehive support. So. Um, assuming the virtualization extensions make it into a silicon, um, we'll have Cherry Beehive support on Cherry Silicon. Be Beehive is not an emulator, <laughs> so um, so so Beehive. So you can do full emulation through QEMU, um, but conventional hardware does not have the hardware primitives to map Cherry onto. Yes. If you don't reuse address space, do you need to, can you avoid revocation? Yes. So if you're, if you're willing to leak address space, um, you can just leak address space. Um, and that, that works fine. Have you had any thoughts about preventing denial of service attacks against the sweeper? Uh, do we have any thoughts about preventing denial of service attacks against the sweeper? I don't think we've really considered that use case. Um, the main, generally speaking, our model is that the programmer mostly wrote the right code and what they meant. So if they do something really silly, then they've done something really silly. Um, that's, it's not, cl not completely clear that that's true, um, you know, in a, if, if you have a, a uh, JavaScript VM or something. Um, you know, the, the execution model and the entire point of, you know, of JavaScript VM like V8 is to enable arbitrary code execution in a box, but nonetheless, it's arbitrary code execution. That's the whole point. Um, and, and so there, there might be some things, um, but it's not something we've, we've looked at. You know, at some level, you know, you made, your prog you made yourself run slow. Um, so, so you're thinking about pool separation within a process? No, I'm thinking at the system level. Oh. The things that, you know, can't be elastic, that's most important. You have third-party packages for JavaScript and VMs. And have them not compete with the sweeper. Um, so, I, I guess the, the sweeper is run in the kernel, but it is a per-process thing. And it, it and addresses virtual memory within the process. So, so there's, 
So it is, it, there is resource contention um, as a result of just a lot more page accesses and a lot more cache hits, um, or cache misses really. Um, but that's, that's overhead in the process. It's not, they're, they're not nominally, uh, they're, they're not competing for system resources beyond that cache impact. Sorry, I missed the middle. Uh, yeah, so you say that the uh, keeper is per project, right? Yeah. So which means that maybe with kernel to create a kernel uh, thread in kernel with uh, follow up with uh, each project. So each the so the sweeper does in fact use a kernel a kernel thread right. in the current model. I believe is that right, John? Yeah, so, so, so yeah, we do have, we do have a kernel pool, John's saying we have a, a kernel pool of, of revocation threads that we offload to. So I guess there is a, there is a system resource we're contending on. Um, I'm having a hard time understanding you. If you have multiple, I think if you have, uh, if you have more revocation requests than you have available worker threads, mm -hmm. and so your preferred swing is lower. Yes, so, so, so yeah, you, if, if, you, if you have too many worker threads, too many, too many outstanding revocation requests versus worker threads, yeah, that, that, will, that will be a problem. I mean, you're, that's fundamentally running out of CPU cycles, though, I think, in practice. Um, well, I don't know whether, we haven't really explored whether there are delay issues there, I think. So that's a, an open research question. I think it's something Mark wants to look at. Yeah, yeah, Mark Johnston is working on, uh, implemented that part and yeah. thinking about what more to do there. Um, so. Anyone else? We are over time. All right, anyone else? Or Thank you.